an empire founded by war has to maintain itself by war. Charles de Montesquieu chaos was the law of nature, order was the dream of man. Henry Adams chaos is found in greatest abundance wherever order is being sought. It always defeats order, because it is better organized. Terry Pratchett by Holy Sigma's hairy balls, get the fuck off of my lawn Carl France, all the time, to everything and everyone. Welcome to the glorious holy empire of get the fucking fuck out of our woods you goddamn goats. History. Once upon a time there was a badass called Sigma Unberogen. Sigma was actually a good man in spite of because of being a Germanic Conan the Barbarian. Sigma's copious asking allowed him to befriend the dwarfs, whose king Kurgan Iron but granted Sigma a masterfully crafted warhammer known as Galmeras. As a side note, yes, this is the hammer for which Warhammer is named. He did so after Sigma single-handedly saved him from a band of orcs that had kidnapped him. Because Sigma is hardcore like that. So after yet more adventures where Sigma pretended to be pagan Charlemagne. Included his girlfriend's brother turning into a slanish chaos lord and ripping shit up alongside a corn worshipping Norskan chaos lord called Cormac Bloodox. Sigma's unification of the clans is commonly thought to have been completed in minus 15 Ike, where he brought the belligerent and totally awesome two Turgeons under his banner by defeating their leader Arthur in single combat. Sigma then went on a campaign of purgation, freeing the ancestral lands of his people from greenskins and beastmen, which culminated at the Battle of Blackfire Pass where he and the dwarfs crushed a massive orc wag. Sigma then retired to Riekdorf where he was crowned emperor by our Ulrich, the high priest of Ulrich. This remains the holiest day of the imperial calendar and is celebrated in the summer. On the 18th of Sigma's Eat, his rule was just, fair and prosperous and he helped unify and reform the legal code and calendar systems of the tribes until 50 years later Sigma abdicated the throne, decided he was Grimner the Fearless and thought he could go to the chaos wastes past the world's edge mountains and survive. To do this, he teamed up with his old buddy Kilgarn Ironbird, neither of whom were heard of again after they left. And now, they are never to be heard from again. Such is the fate of those who trifle with the northern gods walk the wolf path of Ulrich the expansion. Sigma leaving his young empire left a wee bit of an issue among his chieftains, now known as the Counts. He'd never married or left an heir. At least none anyone knew of, nor had he left any instructions on what the fuck they should do in case he'd want to fuck off and leave the empire all of a sudden. Apparently they thought he was just going to sit there and rule forever like a certain other failure. But since that didn't turn out to happen they had to do something about it. After a bit of hilarity involving several of the counts claiming the throne or otherwise infighting. Until in a rare moment of clarity they decided that maybe they should vote for it. So they did and a guy named Fulk of Wissenland got the biggest chunk of votes and thus became the next emperor. They also renamed themselves as Elector Counts, cause they're the counts that elect. Fulk moved the capital into Nuln, where it stayed for a good while because plenty of other emperors came from there and saw no reason to change this happy little thing. The empire was doing pretty great at this time. So everyone decided to spend all this energy and prosperity for expanding even more. They went to where Kielv is today, poked around the foothills of Dwarfland, integrated a bunch of tribes and petty kingdoms Sigma had overlooked in his time, and pushed themselves into Britannia and border princes. But as much as they could deal with dwarfs and orcs and their fellow men, there was one bunch that wouldn't take no shit from the Empire, and that was, in a rare moment of manliness, Elves. Three different provinces wanted a piece of the pie that was Laurelorn Forest, but the Wood Elf hippies kicked them out of their lawn time and time again. This culminated into the crushing defeat of a Drakwald account known only as the Unlucky, which should tell you everything you need to know. In fact, this defeat pretty much kickstarted the Empire's decline. Drakwald never really recovered from the defeat and they were pretty instrumental in bringing the rest down with them. The clusterfuck. As badly as Drakwald was doing after the defeat, they still had enough money to bribe their way into the Emperor's lofty seat a few times. And boy were they some corrupt fucks, caring far too much for their own pleasure than they cared for the Empire. One of particular note was the fat fuck named Ludwig the Fat, who elevated his halfling chef into an elect account, giving the little hobbits their own vote for the Emperor. 
A fact that they will never shut up about. He also got to troll the two provinces under which the moot had initially belonged, because the daughters of their counts had given him cold shoulder. This sort of incredibly decadent fuckery continued and escalated for over a hundred years. And it was finally brought to an end by a bunch of rat men out of fucking nowhere. They popped up plagues everywhere, conquered roughly half the empire, and drove its people into infighting and chaos. Quick and decisive action was required if anything was to be saved. And so the current ruler, Boris the Incompetent, well, the populace gave him that name. What the fuck did you expect he was like obviously he and his court locked themselves into his palace to party and wait for it to blow over. Instead they all got killed by the Skaven, who let him live just long enough to gloat over their impending victory to him. Most of the empire easily fell to Skaven, but there was one badass named Graf Mandad von Zelt that decided he wouldn't be putting up with this shit. So he rode down from Medenheim and spent the next nine years rallying the human defenders and kicking the disgusting furries out of their land. Subsequently he was elected the new emperor, nicknamed Ratslayer, and dissolved the province of Drakwald to punish them for their fucked rule. Mandad went on to slowly rebuild the empire for the next 25 years before the Skaven killed him in his sleep for revenge of their defeat. Afterwards the Empire would pretty much forget they even existed, partly due to Skaven machinations, partly due to bureaucratic incompetence, but mostly because the writers gobble on furry cock and suck at their jobs, and instead followed on with another 400 years of decline. Only this time in the name of war instead of decadence. Hilarity ensued when two guys, a girl, and a pizza place simultaneously declared themselves the emperor, and fun was to be had for all, unless they died, and many did. The empire pretty much collapsed. Armies of darkness this wouldn't be so bad if they didn't moan when we stab them. Eventually the empire got its shit together, just in time for a new threat to arise. After Drakwald, Sylvania was the nastiest province of the empire. A place where dark magic flowed strongly and its rulers were still corrupt. As the current count lay dying, a man came up, married his daughter and became the new count of Sylvania. As you may have guessed from the name, he wasn't a man, as in not human. He was a marvelous, ballsy badass. Count Vlad spread the curse of vampirism among the nobles and was an iron-fisted yet surprisingly benevolent count to his people. Then. When everyone started noticing the unnatural aspects of his reign he used some of Bone Daddy's cliff notes to summon an undead army and Rothlet stomped several provinces until he reached Altdorf. Before he could win, his magic ring stolen, which had brought him back each time he died no matter how it happened. He was staked by a heroic empire pope who was also staked. On top of him, his wife killed herself Juliet style and his armies were scattered. Since the Empire had suffered too many losses to pursue them, Vlad's progeny successfully retreated to Sylvania and fought among themselves. This led to Conrad von Karstein, vampire Caligula, rising to power. Though he sucked up necromancy, he had many necromancer subjects. Once he allied with the blood dragon vampires he launched another war on the Empire. They even attacked the dwarfs who came to help, with a blood dragon killing the dwarf hiking. An emperor died during this time and there was a new candidate, who everyone supported until his skin peeled open and one of his eyes fell out. Conrad in a rare moment of cunning, had tried to trick them into electing a zombie under his control as emperor. Eventually Conrad's insanity wore his army down or turned them against him and while in an insane fit he was captured and killed with a runefang to the heart. After this Vlad's first vampiric son, Manfred von Karstein had returned from traveling around the world. Manfred was the most cunning. He'd betrayed Vlad so he would die and spent his journey learning magical knowledge. After assuming rulership of Sylvania he spent 10 years gathering his power in secret before launching an invasion when the empire was at its weakest. He did well until he got to Old Dorf. Manny wasn't the only one who'd been learning and the Empire Pope at the time used magic to unbind his army. After a cat and mouse game across the Empire, the humans, with Elf and Dwarf help, cornered Manford at Helfen. After the humans and dwarfs defeated his army, the elves were needed elsewhere. An Elector Count chased him down, split his head open with a runifang and his body fell into the swamp where they couldn't find it. Ending the Vampire Count's bid for power. For now. Great war against chaos. Meanwhile, 
in the chaos wastes, as the empire was doing pretty much worse than it ever had or probably ever would. Someone else was doing awesomely, and that someone was the Lords of the North who were feeling pretty fucking strong right now and thought that time was ripe to unleash the rapper train to the south. They started by marching to Kiev, which sent distress messages to the elect accounts, but that didn't go down too well. No one could trust anyone enough to choose someone in overall command. High priests of Sigma and Ulrich squabbled over who got to lead. And a lot of the nobility just flat out refused to send help because they were afraid someone might blindside them when no one was looking. Several decided to fuck it all and converted to chaos. Shit was looking real grim. But there was this one nobleman and a priest of Sigma named Magnus. Not that one who didn't give in. And so he began to wander about and bitch slap the others into line. Taking the charge of this whole shit fest when it didn't look like anyone else was going to. In a particularly controversial move. He even gathered up a bunch of magical misfits. Witches and hedge wizards and other such that had been persecuted throughout empire's history. And with a little help formed them into a more or less coherent magical army that almost never spontaneously exploded. Then... As word came that the city of Prague had fallen, he marched his ragtag army north to face chaos. When he got there Kiev was under siege, so he added his force to the defenders and bitch slapped the chaos forces away from there. He followed them and fought them everywhere, mostly woods, though, until they broke and ran right back to their wastes like pussies. Then he marched home and was immediately crowned emperor because everybody loved him. He ruled for 65 years. The best years in the empire since Sigma himself, and was forever known as Magnus the Pious, even despite the clearly heretical move of founding the Great Orders of Magic instead of putting the whole lot to torch, and a rumor that he once tried to put his hand up a vampire woman's dress. Present day, it's been a couple hundred years since Magnus's time, and the empire is doing okay. Nothing of particular interest has happened at this time. There was a bit of shenanigans going on about some guy, but it got ritzconned away. The current emperor is a dude named Karl Franz, and somewhat unusually to a guy that was elected rather than taking the throne by liberating the empire of some great enemy. He is pretty badass. Then shit happened. As in the Age of Sigma, the realm of Azir may be considered its distant descendant. With the cities of Sigma Battle Tome, we now have an up-to-date but still very clusterficky mishmash of Germans. Eels and Duarden all to represent the various settlements and strongholds where the average folk who haven't sworn themselves to chaos or Nagash reside. Alongside this, these cities can also include fantasy marines to complement your imperial guard like men without having to include any allies. Though you could ally with other order forces, these are limited by city, and the proposed build from any realm mechanic was woefully limited to locking your choices between two realms, fire and life. Not to matter, the build options are still quite staggering, and you also cast all endless spells as if you were in the native realm. The Cult of Sigma. Sigma soon became Jesus following his disappearance from the world. Sigma's people began to believe he achieved apotheosis and created a cult worshipping him, which by the powers of war priests, is pretty much true. With Johann Hellstrom as his first worshipper the first pope of the church of Bash your evil face in with a hammer. Gal Maraz. And soon all hammers became the central religious symbol of the cult. Along with a twin-tailed comet which was said to have appeared at the sky on the night of Sigma's birth. In the end times, it was revealed that Sigma did in fact ascend, but only because Tsinch in its eternal wisdom saw Sigma as a threat to their grasp on the world, and bound him to the magical wind of heavens in ethereal form. This made him godlike, but also bound him up due to the vortex in the middle of Elthuen leaving him with only the ability to bestow miracles and assorted boons to his flock. Of course no one but Sinch knew this, so the cult just went on believing their boy was away and had been elevated by his own hand. While primarily a religion for warriors and soldiers, the cult of Sigma has been successful partly because of the many facets of its worship. The state trooper praised to Sigma for victory, strength of arms and courage, the scholar prays for insight into the dark corners of the world to ensure the safety of the nation and its people and the farmer prays to avoid being skullfucked by perverse, 
Shit covered Goatman. Sigma is quite a cosmopolitan god in that way, and the cult of Sigma knows this and plays to this strength, allowing the older gods to be worshipped for their specific boons and domains. While Sigma remains the Everman's faith, the man become god that once walked the empire. Only the witch hunters may disagree with this. To the more zealous members, tall worshippers may as well be closet nerd lights. And surprisingly, the cults of Ulrich and Sigma come into various religious disagreements, with the former seeing the latter as prissy little cunts who would rather spend their time meditating instead of charging into battle. Tell that to the Sigmarite warrior priests, and growing their beards like real men. And the Sigmarites think they're bellicose and uneducated simpletons, which is ironic considering Sigma himself was a devout Ulrichan. Obviously. The Ulricans are the correct ones here. Thwip heresy but neither side lets this get in the way in defending the people of the Empire. And the only asses in the whole cult are witch hunters. And even that isn't saying much. Political structure. They have 10 provinces with pseudo-German names that you can't pronounce unless you're gargling salt water. Avaland. Hutchland. Middenland. Norland. Not to be confused with Norska. Ostland. Ostermark. Reichland. Sterland, Tadabakland, Wissenland, all of which are ruled by elector counts who are the, supposed, descendants of the the tribal warlords Sigma forged his empire with. However, given how elector lines often perish in battle, died out due to incompetence, intermarrying with other noble families and various other medieval things, the current elector counts on average have nothing to do with the olden clans of the empire's ancestors. The electors also elect the current emperor, a practice the writers of GW have liberally cribbed from the Holy Roman Empire, as they have for every aspect of the empire. Also, the Grand Theogonist Pope, the two arch lectors, the Theogonist left and right hand men, are Ulrich, Viking Pope. Also get a vote on who to elect. The final vote is cast by the Elder of the Moot, whose people were granted a vote because of their additions to Empire Cuisine. Also some bribery. With said cuisine, the Emperor is elected from one of the ten counts, except for extremely badass exceptions like Magnus. So you can imagine that the election process is always a massive clusterfuck of political infighting. The current Emperor is Karl Franz. Elector Count of Reichland and has a good record for getting shit done. It should be noted that while it's never explored in depth that there are regular counts considered beneath the Elector Counts. It's most likely a case of a three-level government body typical of a democracy with a federal level. The Emperor. A state level. The Elector Count. And a local level. The regular count. Some provinces also have barons. But whether these are some other class beneath regular counts or simply counts by another name is unknown. Military. Three things make the Empire great. Faith. Steel. And gunpowder. Magnus the Pious the Empire is based on early modern Germany and their military is no exception for the most part. But a few of their units draw from other areas as well. Pictured. The reason why the Empire has survived for so long. Infantry and Cavalry. In the 17th century the creme de la creme of military tactics was the Tercio, otherwise known as the Spanish Square. Spanish Third or, as we know it today, the pike and shot formation. Composed of pikemen, swordsmen and early handguns, the Tercio would see the pikemen at the forefront, defending against infantry and especially cavalry while the gunners fired their relatively short ranged and slow loading guns. While the swordsman, called Redellarus, would help break the deadlock that occurred when two blocks of pikemen clashed face to face. As the guns got better, the swordsmen were phased out. The gunners could also be moved from the front toward the flank to allow more tactically defensive maneuvers. The whole tertio was further supported by heavily armored cavalry, called cuirassier. Due to the superiority of pikes, the lance was dropped from the usage of heavy cavalry and instead long barreled pistols were taken up as the primary weapon and caracol, which means snail, ironically, tactic was invented. The cavalry would fire their guns, then wheel around to reload, and then circle back and fire again. They also often carried pistols to fire quickly or in an emergency. Generally, cavalry had a hard time facing against a tertio. As the handguns got better and the wheeling caracol got less and less effective. Often, the commanders would have the cavalry charge formations until they were point blank range, 
as the pistols often had mace heads and blades mounted on to make improvised melee weapons. Incidentally this time period is when we get the term bulletproof as cavalry armor would be shot with a pistol before it was sold. If the armor stopped the bullet then it was proofed and was then sold as being able to offer proper protection. If the bullet went though the armor, well, good luck selling it. If that sounds a bit like the Empire, it should. That was the Spanish square in Switzerland. Halberds were used in place of the swordsman. The Swiss guard in fact still used halberds ceremonially. While in Germany soldiers also used halberds and legends say the Doppelsogner. Mercenaries who volunteered to fight on the front line for more money could do the same with two-handed greet swords called Zwiehornas by using the weight of the sword to smash though the wall of pikes. Considering the empire's principal enemies are massively ripped, chaos worshipping viking warriors and awesome plate armor with physical strength and skill beyond that of any other race. Green-skinned football hooligans with inhuman resilience and never-ending numbers. Man-rats with horrific technology and goat-headed. Chaos mutated killing machines the use of halberds with their greater ability to cut though meaty target over pikes makes a lot of sense. Likewise, the Empire's detachment system is surprisingly accurate being very representative of the discipline these formations held with units of men armed with distinctly different weapons acting in support of each other. The Empire's pistoliers are indicative of the cuirassier while the knights, without the competition of heavy pikemen because none of the Empire's enemies have the discipline to hold a pike wall, take up the traditional knightly role of shock troops. In addition, the attitude and bravery of pistolier units in the fluff seems to be drawn from the light cavalry units of later eras, such as Napoleonic Hussars, who were basically pirates on horseback. The name is even related to the word Corsair. Outriders come from a different military unit, however, that to the Dragoon. A Dragoon was an infantryman who rode from point A to point B but once at point B got off his horse and fought on foot. When they say, Wait for the cavalry they mean wait for the dragoons because they were used as troubleshooters and fast reaction soldiers to plug gaps in the line. But the bigger part of their influence is the US cavalry deployed by the north in the civil war. Northern cavalry were armed with early breech loading carbines. One confederate solider said that they, the unit of cavalry armed with the weapon, could load on Sunday and fire all week. A clear parallel to the Outriders repeater handguns. For completeness sake, Southern Cavalry were armed with revolvers. Also of note, the fact that the Empire's Outriders are heavily entwined with the engineers of Nuln is likely a reference to the fact that many Dragoon units were cross-trained as sappers and combat engineers. Due to the fact that they ranged ahead of the main army and thus often had to repair or build bridges and outposts. Big guns. Cannons. However are what ultimately killed the Tertio. As field artillery got better and better, the Tertio, a tightly packed group of men, became easier and easier targets. The blocky Tertio evolved into the flat lines of Napoleonic warfare so that one would need a flanking cannonball to get a whole rank of soldiers. The Empire's cannons are muzzle loaders and muzzle loaders, given that the ball speed is relatively low, are measured by the weight of their shot. Modern guns. Because speed is more important and because muzzle size no longer correlates to shell weight, generally use muzzle size. The British were slow to swap over, which is why the 17-pounder and 88mm fought against each other in World War II. Given the size of a great cannon, it can be estimated that Empire field guns shoot between a 68-100-pound ball, which is huge, but they have to shoot monsters with them so there we are. Empire cannons are pre Gustavus Adolphus, a Swedish king who revolutionized warfare by making his army the most artillery happy in the world by using a lighter cannon. He stopped using everything bigger than 3 pounds, 24 pounds if you include his few siege guns, so his army could move faster as the really heavy guns would not slow them down. Far more often because the guns were lighter, and, more importantly, he used a lot more of them. How much more? Almost six times as many as his enemies. In one battle, despite being heavily outnumbered, he fired six times for every one of his enemy and won massively. That said, the Empire could be justified in using a heavier ball because Gustavius, bad as that he was, did not have to fight bloodthirsters. As for their mortars, not much to say, 
the Empire often neglects their historical use, siege breakers, but otherwise they're fairly accurate. Artillery puns. Alternate take. The Empire lives in a post gust of the Great World, as its great cannons are considered their siege equipment which as contemporary in our world for the period were essential for campaign and as such are able to be limbered up and move while still powerful enough to breach most fortifications as most smaller siege guns were at this time. In times prior and for significantly well developed fortifications it required much larger siege cannons which had to be assembled on site. Ever wondered why a cannon maker in older total wars is called a bell foundry because church bull makers went from church to church casting the massive, often half ton bells on site and as such were the only people with mobile metal casting techniques of the quality needed for cannon. And kings put them to work. The light, mobile and tactically adept field guns can be seen as the hill blaster volley gun, which fires shot larger than handgun rounds but not cannon sized, tactically offering a canister shot like effect but with likely easier to write tabletop rules instead of draw a 25 degree angle out from the cannon muzzle. Everything in that range is dead. The reason you can't one, one with the real world in this situation is because as stated above, the nature of monsters and how that would change the battlefield. Just the change from very fragile, frightened humans to massive unflinching beasts who can take a cannon shot without dying automatically would alter things radically, one would assume. Back on topic now. On the subject of guns. The Hellstorm rocket battery is based on the Congreve rocket. They were invented by William Congreve, much like the Empire. Real weapons tended to get named after their inventors. They were based on rockets stolen when the British conquered Mysore. Just like the Imperial rockets, Congreve rockets used a big stick to stabilize themselves in flight. The rockets were used from 1806 until 1850 when they were replaced with hail rockets that spun themselves in flight so they did not need a stick. They could also be inspired by some rare renaissance organ guns with multiple decks. Just having their gun barrels swapped out with rocket mounts. Or maybe even the Korean Hwacha, which was a multiple rocket launcher on wheels from the 15th. Hill blasters are based on some volley guns that were made in small quantities during the late 16th and early 17th century. Just like the real one pictured. It works by having multiple barrels divided by decks which can be turned around a shared rotation axle. From the video game TWW it can be seen to be up guns from its real life counterpart to be a sort of contemporary of the dwarven organ gun, as it fires small yet still cannon sized shells, anything greater than 20.79 inches is a cannon by classification. For your information, a hill blast a volley gun in real life and heavily armored steam powered cavalry. The empire's steam tanks however are, perhaps unsurprisingly, the most unrealistic part of their army even then they are somewhat plausible. The problem with steam as a method of propelling a vehicle is that it's relatively inefficient as a propellant despite what steampunk enthusiasts tell you. The issue is that to turn coal into power, first you need to burn the fuel in order to heat the metal holding the water over the fire, the pan as it were, then heat the water to 100 plus degrees celsius to boil it, then have the steam travel a set of pipes to the pistons, then you need to work the pistons, and then you need to turn the wheels or propeller, all the while you're losing energy due to thermodynamics at each step. Plus as compared to petrol, coal and wood have less energy per pound. Trains and ships can get away with using coal and wood power because, like a quadratic wizard, they pass a point where they became so big they become able to lug enough water and fuel, either coal, wood or oil though the empire most likely uses wood given how heavily forested the empire is. To power themselves for long distances, and as you go farther along you become lighter since you're burning fuel as you go. Steam power may be relatively inefficient, it's also relatively simple since they're mostly plumbing to put together to scale up to a level that gas engines can't do nearly as well. So getting something as small as a tank to carry enough fuel and water for any length of a fight, along with all the powder, weapons, ammo and armor is a very tall order. War machine as a point to compare, tells us that a warjack can operate for only 30 minutes to an hour. The Empire's steam tank is doubly handicapped by the fact that not only it does not use black powder, 
it shoots its cannon with compressed steam, which would further chop down the likely running time of the engine. That said, the steam tank is not completely unrealistic. As mentioned, the Empire is very heavily forested with plenty of rivers and small bodies of water. While they may only be able to run their tanks for less than an hour, refueling would be a simple procedure of chopping some trees down and pouring a few buckets of water in the internal tanks. The law has the inventor dying while testing alcohol-fueled aircraft so this might have some relation to the tanks. Of course, the Empire also has magic so they could just point a bright wizard in front of the boiler and tell him to go nuts. So in truth it's not the steam engine that is the biggest problem with the steam tank. The biggest issue with the Empire's steam tanks, aside from the steam powered gun, is the horrible design. Forget about the jokes about the Lem and Russ battle tank being a poor design for looking like a World War I tank. The steam tank's four wheels would make the thing sink into any ground that was not paved unless it was dense soil or other such stable features instead of loose dirt or sand or soft clay. Or, god forbid, mud, and the rickety wooden axles would likely snap at any speed over rough ground and replacing it with metal has its own weight and engineering issues. And it's likely they use a steam cannon since a proper gun would shatter them if fired. The steam cannon's description seems to imply it's like a fire hose that shoots scalding vapor. Aside from the steam tank's sheer complexity, its shitty design is likely the only thing keeping the Empire from forming its own panzer divisions. Although, there may also be alchemical or magical aspects. Since when the guy that built them died the Empire didn't understand the designs. Even so. At least the Lemon Russ has the excuse that it was just an STC tractor someone slapped guns on. The steam tanks of fantasy were designed to be mobile weapons platforms. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for Kumja models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Other odds and ends. So, that's most of the Empire's army, who have we not covered yet that does not use magic flagell and so. This will be fun. Jolly smashing. Old bean old sandwich old pringle old teapot old sport old cracker old boy old fish cake old mushroom etc etc what what. Britishness intensifies. Flagellants are, like the unit, people who beat themselves almost dead in penitence for their sins and the sins of the world. The Empire's unit originates from the Dark Ages during the height of the bubonic plague. Just when it would seem that God Sigma's judgment really was coming down upon the world. Flagellants were more than just nuts desperate for some sense in the world. They were people mad at the church. They were declared heretical, yay. Because they said they had a way to cleanse themselves of sin. That being self-torture, which was something the church said only they could do. A few miracles were also attributed to the flagellants like those of a child being brought back from the dead and a talking cow. The real world flagellants were not really able to fight all that well, since they were, you know, peasants, and poorly armed. Beaten peasants at that, and for the most part the empire's flagellants are just as inept at combat with their staying factor only being attributed to them being so frothing mad that they didn't care who else died alongside them. They're not really a military unit though, they're sort of military hangers on whom the empire tolerates rather than burn like the real world inquisition did. There's also the free companies. These fill in the role of irregular infantry, whom were, for a lack of better words, soldiers that weren't soldiers. Free companies are basically militias, a collection of mercenaries, peasants pressed into service, and local citizens that follow the army and fight like everyone else. These have a multitude of real life comparisons. From the minutemen of the American Revolution, 
the Spanish guerrillas of the Peninsula War, the resistances of World War II, peasant mobs of the medieval period, the Barbary of the Roman army, and many more. Historically, irregulars were local men who quickly armed themselves with whatever could be used as a weapon, typically either in defense of their homes or, in the medieval period, were quickly being levied to act as fodder while the militias and knights did most of the actual slugging it out. In later periods, militias would become the irregulars, with men often coming to the aid of the army armed with outdated muskets and antique swords. Unlike flagellants, Irregulars have an actual noted fighting record, but as the definition is so loose this record is mixed. Some, such as the Franks, Tyras and the Minutemen have records for their fantastic use of less conventional tactics and ability to disrupt the enemy. Others, like the Confederate Bushwhackers and Union Jayhawkers of the American Civil War were little more than armed gangs who spent most of their time fighting other militias and terrorizing civilians. Some, like the colonial militias of the Indian Wars, and even earlier, in the Caribbean, had a record for throwing down their weapons and retreating the moment combat actually started. The Cossacks and Pindaris both have well-known records as fantastic horsemen in their respective armies, but don't really have a comparison available in Warhammer, at least, not in the Empire. So in conclusion the Empire has surprisingly thick roots for all the units you can field on the tabletop excepting those that use magic since we don't have magic ourselves, apart from the only thing holding Tomb King's models together. It's also clear that the fact the Empire manages to survive the onslaught of hundreds of threats despite their allies being doucher bags shows that their military is nothing to sneeze at, thus showing that the common warrior priest is not only likely miles tougher than the all too feared inquisitor lord, he is also perhaps leading a group of men almost as well organized and as disciplined, while having balls not seen on anyone who is not from the imperial guard. The empire also shows that you don't have to be a superhuman to be tough as hell, they prove that at the end of the day, Humanity can overcome a threat by working together and standing firm even when by all the rights you should run. Oh, and liberal application of black powder. Except not really, because imaginary games with dice and little plastic fellows doesn't prove squat. If a fictional character can inspire true pathos, then a tabletop game can show you the meaning of courage when one of your units passes a leadership test in the face of the odds and that lets you win the game. Technology. Of all the human civilizations that get their own army books in WFB the Empire is by far the most technologically advanced. They have muskets and cannons aplenty, the odd rifles, the a few steam powered tank and some downright steampunk things like mechanical horses. If they could only figure out the McCormick Reaper, Bessemer Converter, Spinning Jenny, Flying shuttle, gatling guns and rifle muskets they would be taking over the world in a few decades. Most of their technological marvels comes out of the city of Nuln. The only civilizations which have them be technologically are the dwarfs and chaos dwarfs. The former being hindered only by old tradition and superstition, and the latter hindered by directly eschewing those two ideals and being few in number. Odd ones out are the Skavenu despite commonly employing genetic manipulation, bionic implants, chemical weapons, and laser guided missiles, have such a high tendency to blow up themselves and their society that they're no real threat to the world. Yeah. If you're in front of them you are screwed but generally they can never get the empire because they just kill each other first. These few may have the empire beat, but the humans advance steadily and avoids the trap of medieval stasis that so many other fantasy kingdoms settings fall into. Well for the most part at least. A few of their books such as Iron Companies paints a very adversarial relation between them and their own technology, or to be more accurate, the common men and priests and their technology and their own engineers mystifying the whole thing likely does not help. A simple smooth bore cannon is seen the same way we view cyberpunk artificial intelligences, unnatural and useful perhaps, but something to be ill trusted and carefully watched over. Considering the empire is at a 16th or 17th century tech level, roughly, and it was not until the late 1800 that we figured out how to make a cannon that was fairly likely to not blow up after repeated firings. They may have a point. Remember, the black powder mishap table is historically accurate. Make no mistake, the empire is moving forward, 
but if we compare their technology to our own development there are some major discrepancies. They seem more ignorant and less learned than a culture with the printing press should be. They have the technology, but the constant threat of outside attacks has made them much more suspicious of anything that goes outside their day-to-day -day understanding. And that this more than anything else kills their rate of progression. Example, lightning hits house. We would ask does it strike some houses more often than others an empire citizen would say a witch have smitten the end half the time. They would be right. A lot of scientific methods and formulas have to be thrown out when supernatural powers such as magic and the existence of gods is a known fact rather than a heavily debated matter. Do indeed exist and can twist lots of fundamental forces. And scientific advancement as a whole can easily be torpedoed when one of the chaos gods decides to turn the laws of physics inside out on a whim. When the rules behind the universe cannot be examined without going mad or worse. Technological development slows to a crawl out of simple self-preservation since you don't know what force behind the universe you may find with your study. Just like the Adeptus Mechanicus but with less machine worship and no STCS to fall back on. Provinces and city-states. Provinces. Midland. Home to the cult of Ulrich the provincial colors are blue with a red flag. Midland and its capital Midenheim are basically the most viking and war loving you will get without worshipping chaos making them like the Danes Prussians of the setting. Considering their more militaristic society and arch rivalry with Reichland who could be considered the equivalent of Austria, wears blue uniforms, with white bits, Avaland, rich as hell from cattle ranching and overland and river trade, on good terms with its neighboring provinces, and conveniently located with solid buffers between its lands and most of the dangers the empire faces. This leads to a tendency towards foppish and lazy nobles and merchants, but also a very large and well-funded standing army. Had a batch it insane. But super badass, elector count named Marius Leetdorf who was nevertheless a military genius, and lives on in the hearts of the empire for his noble sacrifice. Chief threat is from orcs, Avaland maintains the empire's first line of defense against invasions coming through the Black Mountains and is home to a number of proud military units and knightly orders. Pretty scenery and based a lot on Bavaria. Black and yellow uniforms. Often with a higher standard of tailoring even for enlisted men. Hochland. Nothing but beastmen. Illiterate peasants. And few bands of incredibly badass rangers wielding magic bows and the famous Hochland long rifle. The most effective firearm ever created by humans. Unfortunately, it's expensive and they only know how to make them in Hochland. Which is precisely jack shit industry. Probably based on the Black Forest region of southern Germany. Red and green uniforms. Norland. Northernmost province of the empire and the most likely to get their faces rearranged on the regular thanks to living across the sea from those nice, spiky, viking lads. Putting it alongside Cardia as a home of badass Gromerl bald state troops. Ulrich is worshipped widely here. Their colors are blue and yellow. So they're probably Swedes Pomeranians of the setting. Swedes were Vikings and were never part of the Holy Roman Empire. But they did occupy Pomerania for some time during and after the Thirty Years War so wears blue and tan uniforms. Ostermark. On the border with Kiev. And so is a close second to Norland for getting fucked by chaos. But more than makes up for this by also getting fucked by the vampire counts across the river. Orcs and goblins invading from every direction. And from there being more beastmen in the forests than there are fucking trees. Despite having a shitload of potential. Fertile lands. Tremendous natural resources. Its development has been stalled by weak and idiosyncratic leadership. Chaos obviously. Orc invasions. Including Grimgar Ironhide. Periodic conflict with Kiev and vampire invasions from Sylvania. No cities or even really large towns. On account of the invasions. Making its populace mostly backward and rural. Bash brothers with Kiev when they aren't trying to conquer each other. Also home to the dreaded city of Mordheim. Ultimately, kind of a sad old wreck. Basically Brandenburg without the clout. Geographically would also include parts of Silesia. But Silesia was too prosperous and urban to really be analogous. Wears super cool purple and yellow uniforms. Ostland. Northern province. 
neighboring Kiev and Midland. Their uniforms are black and white, fiercely proud and elsewhere despite their impoverished nature, a lot like Ostermark. Just less pathetic and more grim defiance of the bad hand they are dealt. Likely based on Saxony, with some Silesia thrown in, with the same caveats as for Ostermark. Reichland the heartland of the empire where the current emperor lives. Their uniforms are generally white with some red on them. Chief threats are beastmen, orcs, the occasional Britonian, and, theoretically at least, Drachenfels. Obviously a prime target for chaos and vampires. But usually they don't get close enough to disturb anyone's morning beer or witch burning. Clearly and obviously based on Holy Roman Austria and the Rhineland. Also home of most iconic human blood bowl team the Reichland Reavers. Who wear blue and white. Sterland. The poorest state of the Union. It's considered a rural backwater. But is still more stable and less prone to invasions than Norland. Ostland and Ostermark. Their chief concern in the latter respect is obviously the fact that they're right next door to Sylvania, home of the fucking vampire counts. So the undead is a common thing in their backyards. Also have to deal with the occasional wirek for flavor. Its colors are yellow and green, likely based on eastern HRE lands like Slovakia and Hungary. Slovakia was a non-state part of the Hungarian kingdom until the early 20th century. While the latter was never integrated directly into the HRE, Posen or Slovenia, like Sterland, they were large HR states but not the richest. Talabgland, yellow and red uniforms, highly elite armies with lots of great swords and shit like that. However, due to being mostly forest, not many cannons or shit like that. Chief threats are beastmen, orcs and undead represents a pretty broad band of central HRE territories east of the Rhine and north of the Danube. That is Hesse, Thuringia, Hanover, Bohemia, Moravia, etc. As the name suggests, the most popular god here is Tal. The name comes from the Talabek, which is his sacred river, wears yellow and red uniforms, leading to a slight distaste of their armies. As everyone instantly just thinks of McDonald's. Wissenland's technically known as Wissenland Turf being the province's largest city. So they're ruled by Countess Emanuel who may or may not be a slana she whore. Though apparently she hates everything outside Nuln even though it's not the capital of the province. The province of Wissenland lack the military funding of other provinces and city-states. Cause Emanuel gives no fucks. No way she gives all the fucks just not to Wissenland and its standing army makes heavy use of ambush and hit and run tactics. They field mounted archers and woodsmen above artillery and massed infantry. Slightly paradoxically, the province of Wissenland is also famous for their pikemen, probably cause Britannia's just over dem mountains. They wear grey and white uniforms. Seems to be an odd mix of influences, such as Switzerland, mountainous and temperamentally obstinate from the rest of the empire. Bavaria, culturally rich, and Nuln resembles the powerful free imperial city of Nuremberg. It also could be a reference to the Ruhr and the Rhineland. Again, given the industrialization, the moot, technically not a elector state even though they get a vote on the next emperor, home of the halflings and essentially a nasty, drunken, weirdly sexual and shitty practical joke prone version of the Shire. Chief threats are overeating, rudeness, Public masturbation, the undead, and Avaland. Hunting halflings for sport was legal in Avaland until roughly a century before the present day of 8th edition. The keen eye of Karl Franz on Marius Liedorf was the only thing preventing the practice from returning. City states. Altdorf, a wretched hive of ritual and bureaucracy. The further you get from Karl Franz, the shittier it gets. This includes the inside of his house. Imagine Ankh Morpork. But instead of being funny, it's just terrifying in German. Politics based on Vienna. But geographically it's Frankfurt. Gets turned into Stalingrad during the end times. Red and blue uniforms. But with incredible extravagance. Middenheim. Home of the Viking Pope. A fuckton of wolf shit and tunnels packed to the gills with horrors. Nearly destroyed by Archeon. Geographically, Berlin or Dresden. Quartered blue and white uniforms. The city is set atop a mountain called the Forsklag and heavily walled. Despite the priests of Ulrich having a low opinion of firearms in general, 
they seem to approve of their use in sieges. Medenheim is home to an absurdly large cannon used during the Storm of Chaos and loaded by a giant named Thunderball. Rip, Nuln gets shit done with more factories, guns, universities, dwarfs, engineers, and dwarf engineers than anywhere else in the human old world. It's practically a 19th century city with a higher standard of public health and city planning than much of the rest of the empire. Just avoid the batfuck crazy counters and wear a helmet around the guild of engineers' outbuildings during exam week. Also home of the greatest emperor since Sigma, Magnus the Pious, though Cal France is probably actually greater post Storm of Chaos, and definitely greater as Sigma reborn when Storm of Chaos got rids conned in favor of the end times. Vienna by geography. Economically a mashup of Nuremberg, trade, and Breslau, industry. Almost entirely black uniforms, as if they spilled null oil on the cloth, with some teeny tiny bits just being of whatever color the wearer feels like. Talabheem, dirt tree worshippers. Also the most defensible location on the planet, although that didn't stop Epidemius and the Magathriders from taking it. It is also the single most militarized city in the Empire. Midenheim don't got shit on this to the point that their entire economy, philosophy, religion and way of life is devoted almost solely to the army, which is why their troops are the most commonly seen empire army on the tabletop. It sits in a massive and heavily fortified crater into which there is precisely one entrance. Geographically Prague-ish. No, not that one. For lack of a better option. These are the dudes in red and white that you see on the boxes of Empire models. Former provinces. Soland. Soland was destroyed as an independent imperial province by Da Great Wyag Gorbad Iron Claw. One now of Da Greatest and Greenest Warbus. Its territory was ultimately absorbed by Wissenland. The fate of Soland and its people is a sore point for a lot of Wissenlanders. So much that their banner has the white lion waving the flag of Soland as a show of respect. Probably based on post Hussite Bohemia. Westerland, the province that was the seat of the great commercial city of Marienburg that seceded from the empire. The province is now known as the Wasteland, though the Marienburgers prefer the Free League of the West. Obviously based on the Low Countries. Was briefly known as Westerland when Norse Chaos Marauders conquered and ruled it for a brief time. Between Norsk and Britonian and imperial raids and the huge amount of marshland, very little of its territory is suitable for agriculture. Its people make their living by trade, mining, and fishing. Based on the Low Countries, Netherlands, Luxembourg and Belgium. Sylvania. Sylvania was formerly the county of Sylvania, an independent imperial province, but after the events of the Vampire Wars is now officially a part of the Grand County of Stirland. No other province of the Empire wants the place. To tell the truth, Stirland doesn't much want it either. The province has long been the staging ground for vampiric attempts at the Imperial throne after the von Karsteins took control of its nobility. In an action disregarded by everyone after his death, Manfred seceded Sylvania from the Empire. It's now Nagash's playground. Inhabited by some of the world's most paranoid peasants and filled with more spooky shit than a ghost's outhouse. Obviously based on Transylvania. Drakwald, a founding province of the Empire located near the center of the Drakwald forest, now divided up between Middenland and Norland, was known for its two incompetent emperors. One being Ludwig the Fat who gave the elder of the moot an electoral position after a halfing chef made the finest meal for his fat ass. Though he was also punishing the elect accounts, so fair enough on this specific act. The other being Boris Goljada, who was known for being greedy and got his ass shivved by a sneaky Eshin rat during the Skaven's plague invasion. The province was finally disbanded by Manwood Scavenslayer after these two atrocities. Sigma bless you. At times, other parts of the old world were under imperial control but were later lost and not recovered as other nations established themselves. Examples are the Westmark in what would later become Paravan, Lichtenberg in what would later become the Border Princes, and parts of what would later become Kiev. Few of these acquisitions lasted long. Relations. Non-chaotic humans. Kiev. Millennia before the Ice Realm was even founded. Sigma made a deal with Ungold chieftains to ensure mutual cooperation against chaos. This alliance is, 
probably, one of the oldest and strongest in the entire setting with Imperials, almost, always coming to battle against northern savages and demons when they invade Kiev, Britannia. Relationship between these countries are a little bit messy. Being fantasy French people, Britannians see citizens of the Empire as inferior in every possible way. On the other hand, Imperials themselves scratch their heads at the sight of Britannian culture. Why do these guys like horses and serfdom so much? Border conflicts happen very often, but in the wake of the common enemies both nations turn into allies. Border princes. It's hard to really pin down a single approach here, as the border princes are essentially just a collection of petty rulers whose credentials range from dubious lineage to holding power through outright banditry that happen to neighbor on each other. Barely disguised contempt is probably a good generalization, but it's really dependent on the situation. As the border princes are implied by GW to be for your dudes and similar I need someone that's politically or militarily relevant but isn't already in the setting purposes. On the other hand, border princes are beneficial for the empire's survival, as they act as a shield and possible distraction for greenskin hordes from badlands. Grand Cathay, due to a significant distance between two empires, and the existence of Darklands. Diplomatic relation between Empire and Cathay are very limited. Cathay an ambassador is a known resident of Alddorf's court, and there is some trade along the Ivory Road. But that's pretty much it. Others. LBN is so isolated both in lore and outside of it. For example. Literally forgotten. That there is no known interaction between it and the Empire aside from an old non-canon scenario for 6th edition. Tillions often serve in Empire as mercenaries or even work there. Like Leonardo da Miraglino. But overall Empire doesn't intervene in their affairs. Marienburg is often seen by some Imperials as their rightful land. But due to an overall shitty situation most citizens of the Empire don't mind their independence. The Empire participated as a lesser partner in the Crusader Feint Terrorby. And since then it dominates trade with it through a colony of Sotenberg. Other countries relationships with the Empire are unknown. Dwarfs. The Doi have been steadfast allies of the Empire since its origins, least of all because of the fact that their most holy weapon was crafted to repay a favor. As such, the Dwarfen peoples have been frequent visitors and trade partners of the Empire, occasionally helping out with things such as smithing and machinyork. Doi can even allow some of their kin to settle in the Imperial lands and convert into their culture which would normally be unacceptable, just because they are such a great friends. Elves Ulthuan. The High Elves have been rather consistent allies of the Empire since the Great War Against Chaos. Before that not much is known about their relationship, with the most significant example being Teclis' contribution to founding the Colleges of Magic. The High Elves have since been considered worthwhile allies of the Empire and High Elf merchants and diplomats frequent various cities as friends. Nagareth. The less that's said of the Dark Elves, the better. While not one of the most frequent raiding targets of the Black Fleets of Nagareth, plenty in the Empire know of the cruel and bloody things that are done to the prisoners of these raids. Not much of them happened though, as Drachii prefer raiding Ulfin or Eastern lands. Wood Elves, they are an infrequent sight. Owing to their disdain of modern civilization, Wood Elves usually prefer to hide in their forests occasionally to pop out to hunt down whatever threatens it, but there have been delegations that occasionally emerge to convene with the Empire on matters pertaining to their territory. The biggest group of them on the Imperial lands is called Yenne, and they are known to live in Laurel or Forest of Norland. Overall, they can be described as less xenophobic and isolationist than their Athel Loren kin. Lizardman. Next to Nehekhura. The jungles of Lustria are one of the most frequent locations for expeditions looking for some sort of valuable treasure. This frequently leads them right into one of the temple cities of the Lizardmen, and thus into conflict. The Lizardmen tend to see these expeditions as little more than interlopers in the Great Plan. Greedy bugs to be repelled with prejudice. Recently Old Worlders, including Imperials, started creating their colonies in the New World which we know won't lead nowhere at all. Conclusion a or some holy roman empire guys who managed to be both fairly grimdark, while also being generally human, intelligent and likable, unlike certain other holy roman empire guys with necrophiliac fetishes. They do their best with what they have, 
and considering what they must deal with on a monthly basis, is it really that much of a surprise that they are the go-to protagonists of the Warhammer fantasy kinda like humans in The Witcher but with a decent enough twist of humans from Lord of the Rings that you can actually like them? They're not a bunch of dirty, seedy assholes but they're nobody's saints. Legacy. By the end of the end times, the Empire was good and well dead, buried in the ground, eaten, polluted and ruined, both in universe and out. But while the Empire itself does not survive the transition to Age of Sigma, the look and feel of it survives somewhat. The Free Guild, mortal armies that serve Sigma and defend the free cities uses the Empire models, all with feathers, floppy hats and griffins. It is noted that while the world of Age of Sigma is extremely varied, remains of the world that was still stay around. Apparently being the explanation for why the new humans of the setting still uses the holy German empire look. Apparently some jit found a floppy hat and deemed it the epitome of fashion. And frankly, who are we to argue so generally? The further from Sigma's golden boy you get in the realms of order, the more empire. Read. Shitty. Ineffective yet awesome. Things get. It's almost like old Britannia in that way. On a side note. Since Cubicle 7 relaunched Warhammer Fantasy roleplay in the old world setting as if the end times did not happen, the whole of Age of Sigma can also be seen as a parallel what if universe, or you can simply play a WFRP 4 year round until the end times then fight in the end times until overwhelmed and promote the party to Stormcast in Soulbound, continuing your dude's adventures graduating from low dark fantasy to high dark fantasy.